right. Hello, everyone. My name is Sajiwa Ekanayaka. I'm a filmmaker and blogger in New York City. I saw a great documentary uh, in late January called Only in Theaters about an art house theater chain in uh, LA, uh, Lamley Theaters. We have uh, Greg and Tish Lamley from the Lamley family here with us. They own uh, the theaters. They've been showing movies for about 85 years now. And we have Matthew Seitz, uh, editor at large at rogerebert.com, filmmaker, and uh, he is a, a Pulitzer Prize uh, finalist for criticism. And we have Raphael Sparge, who is an experienced actor of 40 plus years, and he is now an award-winning documentary director. Welcome to the show, everyone. Matt, how did you like the show? How did you like the movie? I loved it. I mean, and and I would have, I, I probably would have enjoyed it even if it wasn't good. And it's really, really good because it speaks, <laughs> it speaks to, it speaks to a lot of my my kind of preoccupations, or you might say obsessions. Like I believe that movie theaters are essential to really understanding and appreciating cinema. And I think that if you don't, if you're not seeing it with an audience, it's not you're not really getting the full effect of it. And I understand all the arguments to the contrary, technological, financial, and and a lot of other things. But um, as I was telling Sujewa when we were talking in New York last week, a lot of filmmakers who in the last few years have said, "Oh, theaters are not important anymore. I don't care. I, I don't care. It doesn't matter how people see my movie. I guarantee you, every single one of them, if you came up to them and said that movie you just made." Uh, how would you like to show it in a theater? Every one of them would say yes. Not a single one would say no. And if they did say no, I would say, well, you're lying, but we still want to show the movie. <laughs> True. Uh, Raphael, yeah. what made you think uh, this sort of inside baseball type story on paper would be compelling for a general audience? Yeah, I mean, look, the legacy story is what pulled me in. Um, Greg's family um, uh, is in a stout, has, you know, there's been a Lemley in the movie business since there's been a movie business, as Greg says in the film. And, and uh, just just that alone was sort of an astounding fact. And that sort of brought me in, at least initially. What what happened was, as I met the family, as I met Tish, and as I met, you know, Greg's great aunt uh, and, and his dad um, and and the family, the family business, really began to speak to me in a in a profound way. Um, and uh, you know, my 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 family were also uh, immigrant Jews, uh, Ukrainian Jews who came to you know the states and opened up a, a schmata business, a you know fabric business, basically, and in, in the garment district in New York and in, in the Bronx. And I, and I, there was something very familiar and and very uh, very warm and and. Um, and remarkable about a family who's really dedicated themselves to kind of really supporting artists and the art of film uh, for almost a century. And, and just even that alone, um, as as we all know, as as filmmakers, um, at least both of you of you gents who've made films and worked in film, it's it's one you know you kill yourself to make the film, and then once you've got the film, and maybe it's a good film, um, you're suddenly. Uh, in a wasteland <laughs> of trying to figure out what do you do next and where do you go and 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 how do you how do you get up above the noise? Well, these theaters, uh, Greg's theater specifically for me um, uh, as a filmmaker when I was working in Los Angeles, was all about and many 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 others. Why so many remarkable filmmakers talk to us um, uh, is because they have really. Uh, they, they give us a leg up. They give us an opportunity to meet our audience. They get a, give us an opportunity to go from being something, you know, X's and O's on our hard drive to actually being a thing. And, and, and that exchange in a space that is dedicated to absorbing this, this, this piece of art, right? This, this, you know, this, this art form that we've been a part of, it's 125 years old, but, but this thing that is sort of remarkable and ephemeral and, and, and magic that happens in a theater, um, that's what they've dedicated themselves to sort of creating that space. So it's a, it's to me, it's is, and it will always be a business about a family and a family business. Um, and, and, and amidst that, then there's a whole other story that evolved as we were doing it. And, and that's really kind of what, um, 
came through. Um, and, you know, sometimes, you know, docs, as you make them, they, they tell you what they want to be. And that's what happened here. Great documentary. Um, I thought it connected certainly on a filmmaker level, art house film level, but as a document of what a lot of people went through during the pandemic in a way that we haven't really seen in public. And that is, I think, one of the ways that, uh, one of the reasons why a lot of people are connecting with this documentary. It was really interesting. You know, I had this feeling because, you know, obviously we all know what happened in the last few years, but I see that, you know, the bulk of the story is set in 2019. <laughs> and it's this struggle of like, do we, do we sell the theaters? What, you know, what are we going to do here? The business is, 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 you know, decline, revenues are declining. Uh, the world is changing. And the whole time I'm thinking, oh no, they have no idea what's around the corner. Nobody, <laughs> nobody did. To me, it was almost like watching, there's a lot of movies that are set like in the summer of 1963, you know, and there, and there people are talking about their big plans for the fall and you're, you're watching it as a viewer going, that's not, your plans are not going to be quite what you envision. Um, there's a big monster around the corner. Greg, uh, how, as a movie star now, uh, <laughs> how has taken the movie out, uh, Ben, also Tish, you've been at a lot of shows also. Is it just an entirely new thing for you guys to be essentially documentary movie stars and, uh, in, a, and in a sense, distributors going out and promoting the show? What has that experience been like? Well, it's definitely a lot of work, um, <laughs> you know, and, and but which is something I've told filmmakers over the years as I've dealt with them is, you know, there's a point where you have to take off your filmmaker hat and be put on your film sales hat, um, which is an entirely different job. Um, but it's been very gratifying, um, both connecting with, of course, audiences at Lemley Theaters uh, in Los Angeles, but also going out around the country and uh and just not only speaking with audience but speaking with the operators of those movie theaters and um and hearing their response to the film um, so what are uh, some of the other movie theater owner operators saying uh after they see your movie and uh if you can share some of that some of those details here with loretta for instance in salem but well first i was gonna just sure. add that um when we show up at screenings and we introduce ourselves, we're not known and we go off and have dinner and the people watch the movie and afterwards, it, it, we're not exactly movie stars, <laughs> but because Raphael made it so easy to be really open and honest in the film, we tend to get a lot of people coming up to us saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe what you guys went through and thank you so much for allowing yourself to be so vulnerable, especially Greg. Um, but so it's it's not a movie star thing, but it is it's really it's been received so beautifully, and it's really heartwarming to to know that a lot of people look at it and just they they look at it in context of their own experience, whatever it may be, and they're appreciative of how honest it is. So that's, Greg, that's I, I was going to ask Greg, Greg and Tish. Uh, there's a lot of moments in this movie where, you know, a documentary filmmaker, you've showed a million documentaries in your theaters over the years. And one of the struggles that every documentary filmmaker has is, boy, I wish I'd had that on camera. And this is one of those movies where they actually do, like a lot of the really pivotal moments in the story are on camera. They're not just being described later or recreated with animation or stock footage or something. You're actually in the room. And, and what I'm wondering is, were there ever moments when you thought, I uh, kind of wish there wasn't a camera here. This is a bit much. This is a bit much emotionally to be, to be on camera while this is happening. There's a scene in the film when Greg has a breakout of angioedema and his face is all puffy. And our son, Ezra, who was seeing it for the first time with us at the Santa Barbara International Film Festival, turned towards me as he's watching his father on the big screen and he's, he looks like he has the months and he just says, oh my God, I can't, I can't watch this. <laughs> he turns away and I don't know how Greg really feels, but there are, I, I, I how do you feel about that? Are you, you kind of wish it wasn't in the movie? Are you happy? I mean, look, there are things that I wish weren't in the film. There, there are things I wish that had been captured or, or things that I could have said. Um, it's Raphael's film. Um, I didn't see it till it premiered uh, at, at Santa Barbara Film Festival, and um, 
you know, just but while we were going through the process, we kind of established a trust that um, that we were going to be open and honest and um, and not try and <laughs> you know hide anything. Which is an go ahead. Astounding thing because it's such a personal story. I mean, I you know I I I know because Greg and I've talked about it. You know, Matthew um, seeing the film for the first time because Greg has you know had no editorial. Greg or his family had no editorial control. They have no money in this. This is completely. They just opened the door. You know, and and which is an astounding thing. I think Greg's love and understanding of what makes a good doc, perhaps also allowed him to understand uh, that what makes a good doc is actually people speaking candidly and and i and i think i think he did but what 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 i think what what has what what tish was speaking about in terms of kind of the response to the film is that in city after city that i've seen this and and it's both nationally and internationally people have said oh my god i recognize my family or we went through that or i understand this or this is so familiar or that reminds me of my family business that there are things in this that are uncomfortable, but families are uncomfortable, and 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 I and I think you know that they're they're also familiar, you know, and and, and there's something about that that has translated over and over and again, such that when I, I I I've lost count of how many rooms I've walked into with Greg and 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 now Tish, where you know they've gotten standing ovations, um, and and specifically just sort of an immediate rush of like, oh my God, thank you, thank you for. Thank you for what you did. Thank you, you know, for what you do, um, and thank you for this mission that you've been able to communicate. I mean, I, I, I um, you, you know, I mean, I, 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 I go back to just, you know, as filmmakers, and and this is a filmmaker's blog. You know, we as independent filmmakers are, um, you know, it's it's the lifeblood of the industry. I mean, everyone looks to indie indie films to sort of, you know, either for the new directors or for the vision of how the next Marvel movie is going to be made. Um, they they it, it it is so important for a vibrant art form to exist. And and without Greg and or theaters like Greg's around the country, around the world that really support independent film, documentary film, foreign film, we are uh, we are bereft. Uh, the art form is bereft, and 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 these are champions of something that are is so important. And I don't care how big your freaking television is, <laughs> you, you don't get the same experience. It's the movie experience. That's the title only in theaters, right? It, it is a, it is about going into a, a, a literally a, a, a piece of real estate that's dedicated to you having 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 that that vision that 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 particular director's. You know, window into the world, and 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 that's, um, you know, I, I to me that's always been um, what's so astounding about this family and 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 the generationally the, the commitment to that. The family itself is only in theaters as well. That's good. Uh, Tish, uh, during the making of the movie, what were your thoughts? Did you think it would turn out uh, to be releasable, or did you think? Uh, I have no idea what's happening. <laughs> that's that's actually interesting. Um, and as I, filmmakers, this is these are thoughts we have, even though we say it's going to turn out well. Half the time, we're not sure. Right. Um, as opposed to Greg, who agreed to see it for the first time at a film festival, I needed to see it <laughs> before it went public. So Good. Raphael was very kind and he obliged, and I saw it by myself at. At our own theater and i began crying immediately for the first 15 minutes i was just a mess um and i loved it and then as i watched it i thought wait am i loving this because i'm in it mm -hmm. and i'm self-centered <laughs> and it's about my family and my kids are in it and they're adorable and i loved all the interviews and at the end of the movie i thought wait i don't understand am i loving it because it's it's familiar or is it just a really good documentary and and then at the film festival when it won, it got it got played twice at the film festival because it won like an audience award. I thought, oh, it's not just me. <laughs> People really really are connecting to it. Um, but there was a moment at the very beginning when Raphael was interviewing me for the first time. The day before he interviewed me, Greg said, "By the way, we may have to sell the theaters, but don't talk about that in the interview." And I just thought, oh, 
okay, and I have, I have a hard time lying or keeping things secret. So Raphael starts interviewing me and I immediately froze because his first question was, what is it like to be you know, married to Greg Lemley who runs Lemley Theatres? And I just sat there thinking, don't say anything. <laughs> don't say the wrong thing. And I had a panic attack. And Raphael very sweetly said, why don't we start over and I'll, here's a banana. And, you know, your blood sugar level may have been off, whatever. And I thought, okay, I'm just going to start over and I'll think of something else. And it, it was wonderful. But um, that was a hard morning. <laughs> Tish, you had a you had a you had a comment in the in the movie. Yeah. Uh, you were talking about Greg, kind of living, living, being a theater owner like that. Like that is that is a preoccupation. And you know, one one of one of your sons talked about how you know when the bo box office grosses are not good that day, Dad is bummed out that evening, and all yeah. of that. But but you were talking, and I don't want to paraphrase it because I get it wrong. But you were talking about like your acceptance of the fact that this this kind of single-minded obsessive devotion to this one thing is what makes him happy yep and having to accept that and that's something i think everybody who's probably an artist or a small business person probably has to deal with and i i just i found it very moving and i wondered if you could kind of elaborate on it a bit well ultimately that's why he didn't sell the theaters because he is the theaters it would be like selling his soul and he would have been less stressed, but he would have been depressed for the rest of his life. And he would have been wondering, oh, if only, if only I hadn't sold, what could I have done with the theaters? And I, I, I would have been completely miserable being married to that person. So as, as difficult of a time as this has been for him, I'm so proud of him and so happy that he didn't sell. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, being an artist. I mean, uh, all three all three of us are artists, uh, but Greg, what Greg does, presenting film, art house, cinema, which is not popular cinema, that's kind of like an art project. Greg, what do you think? Is it an art project? Uh, I, I don't know if I'd call it art, um, but... I mean, look, you know, we're creating community. Um, I, I don't, you know, work is not, you know, I, I, I like to cook. And when I'm cooking in the kitchen there, I feel maybe a sense of inspiration or I'm, you know, experimenting and, and, and trying to, to do something. Work, you know, it, it's unfortunately you can't, you have to balance the creativity that you want to bring to it, I guess, with the pragmatic side of, you know, we actually have to stay in business doing this um and is this contributing or, or taking away from the bottom line um you know the benefit of being in a family business i guess is that i don't necessarily worry about you know how i'm doing this quarter versus last quarter or anything like that and i can say i i believe this is going to be in the long-term interest of the of the business and if it's not going to bear fruit immediately um it, it will bear fruit eventually um but I, you know, so I don't know if I'm an artist, but I think certainly there's the same passion um, and commitment that an artist uh, brings to their art uh, that I bring to whatever it is that I do. <laughs> you do good work. So 2019 was good business-wise, right? No, tw I mean, tw 2019 was terrible. Box office for art house films was down significantly for most of the year, um, which is what prompted the the question mark about whether to sell or not to sell and, and what was the, the worth of the company. I mean, you know, the, the individual theaters were making business, but it couldn't support the administrative costs uh, of running an independent chain. Um, and, and, you know, and it was really only at the end of the year when you had uh, films like um, Jojo Rabbit and uh, Parasite and a couple other pictures that finally got the box office going again for Art House Films that uh, you know, gave us the confidence to say, no, we're going to, you know, as good as the offer was, it wasn't good enough. And uh, I thought that, that we would be better off not selling. It's really what it came down to. I'm glad you didn't sell. Uh, uh, <laughs> really? Well, <laughs> <laughs> even though it makes three up rough years since then, but, <laughs> but, you know, time will tell. That's right. 
I mean, three years is three years in the span of a hundred is is nothing. I wanted to ask you something. I, I I got the impression, and maybe Raphael wants to jump in on this as well because he's a storyteller. But the the family history is so fascinating to me because it seemed, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, but it almost seems like your family, uh, whatever the common wisdom is, you kind of go in a different direction, and it's worked so far. Like you know, with television, a lot of people I'm. You know, as somebody who studied the history of the medium, there was a lot of doom and gloom. There was a lot of sense of this is this is just not going to work anymore because why would people go out? And of course, they responded with widening the screen, trying 3D, doing road shows and CinemaScope and Cinerama and all this stuff. And then Dolby came in, and you know, there's always something new to draw people back. But the the essential experience is the same. You know the projection has changed, but other than that, when you go to a theater, it's the same kind of thing. But what but what is interesting to me about the way the family uh, pursued this is, you were in general releases right at the beginning. It wasn't until television came in that that you started to think about different kinds of movies, and then the art house pivot happened when in the seventies, right? Well, look, I mean, it, my grandfather. Um... Yes, I mean it was a neighborhood theater, and it mostly played Hollywood films. You know, X days after it opened, in the big theaters, it would play and you know start playing in the neighborhoods. Um, but they were always programming foreign and independent film and okay. alternative content. I mean, we have a flyer back to you know into the '40s where they were playing uh, you know a, a movie, a, a filmed concert um, from Igor Piatigorsky. Um, so um, it just remind me, you know, there's nothing new under the sun um, when we talk about, oh, the Met live in HD. Well, yeah, it's great that it's live, um, but, you know, we've been doing filmed opera, we've been doing, so I, I think there was always an attempt to um, show something different, show something cultural and, and make the theater a, a space. Um, that accelerated during that period, um, you know, after TV came on when, uh, as, as Hollywood films were declining for a few years, yeah, we, we did more repertory. We started doing more art. It was probably in the, you know, a transition from the mid fifties into the early sixties, which is when we started re-expanding again. So we started building, you know, we went from six theaters to one. Uh, and then in 1962, uh, we started building theaters again and rapidly expanded during the sixties. And at that point it became, yes, now it's more of an art theater uh, venue uh, than a commercial theater venue, and then, um, and then there's that, that, that changes over time too. <laughs> and then there's that pivot where I guess it's sometime in the late '60s, early '70s. A lot of the theaters that were doing similar programming suddenly started showing porn, and yes, that, the lonely that, theaters who didn't. <laughs> yes, and we did not, and and in some cases that just meant that we, you know, the film that would have played at a more prestigious art house theater. Uh, which is now playing porn all of a sudden the distributor you know we have now that opportunity to play that film <laughs> that's um, great but you know the commitment was all there to, that kind of, to that thing uh, you know because it wasn't it was never about making the most money it was always about um you know creating a business that the public could count on uh, you know long term for what it you know what they expected from us and as long as it was you know making money and contributing to the, you know, the growth of the family, that was, that was okay. When I saw the documentary, I mean, I live in New York and I go watch art house movies all the time. I don't even really think about Hollywood that much. So when I saw the documentary and I saw, oh, there's a whole family in LA that's been doing this kind of thing forever. It's, it almost becomes like a personal documentary like the history of the family and the chain kind of links up with modern art house indie filmmakers. Um, what do you think, Greg? Uh, uh, should uh, indie filmmakers and art house theaters collaborate more in the U.S. for mutual survival and benefit? Well, I, I think they always have <laughs> um, yeah. to some extent. I, I guess, you know, there's always pressure on the There's always, filmmakers sometimes want to reach, they want to reach the broadest possible audience. Right. And, um, you know, there can be filmmakers who say, no, I want to break out of that art house environment 
um, and have my films play in commercial movie theaters. I want people to see my, you know, there, there are people that go to, that only go to the AMC theater or go to their Regal or whatever. And um, they won't see my film if I'm playing at that funky art house. Um, so sometimes there's a pressure on the upper end to, to break your films to a broader audience. And I, I, I get that. Um, but uh, yeah, which means that just uh, to some extent that the art houses need to be open to working with new voices and, 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 new, uh, and new methods. Yeah, um, John Morsigu, indie filmmaker that uh, Matt knows, said one of his movies played in an art house in Paris for a year. This was like in 1998 or so. Have you had weird uh, runs like that? Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> um, a man and a woman played yeah, for I mean, two well, years yes, back in the day. Uh, that was in the seventies, right? Yeah, two years. <laughs> it's a long uh, time. But, but even long time. you know, even now we're still getting films that play for months and months and months. That's uh, great. You know, Hopefully, my movie will do that. What's that? Hopefully, my movie will do that. Play <laughs> at uh, Lanley Glendale. Also, Lanley Glendale is becoming like a cult theater. I was reading some other article about the film industry and at the end, the filmmakers are like, we got our dream. Our movie played at Lanley Glendale. There was an Esquire article about no budget, uh, no budget cinema. I sent it to, uh, I sent it to Greg. Sweet to hear. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be a cult theater. Were there some parts of the sto story that needed to be told that were difficult to tell because you didn't have people on camera experiencing it or describing it? Well, you know, the, <laughs> the, the probably the most difficult challenge was when this little pandemic came along. Um, I, I, I had a, I live in New York, right? I'm, I'm, I was born and raised in New York. I live in New York. I lived in LA for for many years, um, and I've got many many dear dear close friends there, and I'm I'm back there often. But I was in New York. And uh, pandemic happened, and we're shooting this documentary. And um, I had someone say to me, like, "Wow, it's amazing you had that budget to be able to schedule that that pandemic in the middle of your movie to really give you those the, the added drama." Um, I I uh, that at the IFC Center. <laughs> that was great. Um, I um, you know the hard it was tricky because I was I, I had a very small crew, a skeleton crew, who went out and interviewed Greg and. And, and followed him around and everyone was masked. And this is before there were vaccines um, and, and anyone knew everyone was dying, you know, as far as we knew, and we were shooting. And um, um, we obviously were all taking great precautions, but but that that was tricky to, to be doing that um, in the middle of it. You know, the, the pandemic, it is a is a is an aspect of this movie as it turns out it's only about six or seven minutes of the movie um it is a it is a it is a an important part of this and it does ultimately um speak loudly to all of our experiences particularly when we're re reassembling all the things that happened in that year the one after another after another I say, does, greg do you think there's any future for like there's all those theaters that were closed, you know, the ones that haven't been torn down or converted into churches, pawn shops, or, or condominiums. Could could you could you ever see a future where people open those or or some some chain buys them or just you know like are they just can we go back? I guess is what I'm saying or reinvent uh, what was for now. I mean, the short answer is yes. Not in every case. Um, I mean, theaters are real estate. And uh, they exist according to the, you know, they survive or fail based on, you know, economic factors that are, go beyond the question of, of do people want to go see movies or not? And are they seeing them in movie theaters? So I, I think, you know, it's, it's a little more complex uh, than, than just that, that issue of streaming. Um, you know, some theaters that have been, you know, a bank closed by Regal in their bankruptcy or, or, or another company have been reopened. Uh, not every one of them, uh, but many of them have. Um, you know, some uh, theater that we left has been taken over by Landmark Theater. So, um, you know, we're in a we're in a difficult period right now, and um, I think there's a you know people want you know to know exactly what's going on, and, and you know these things take time to work themselves out. Um, but you know. Will something stay a movie theater or not? I don't know what's going on with the retail environment in, the, in that, you know, 
mm. in that area. You know, I, I'd be more concerned about whether the, you know, the Bed Bath and Beyond store is going to still be a, a place where you can buy a duvet cover, or if that's <laughs> going to become a movie theater. <laughs> Have, right. you about, have you thought about expanding the Lamley brand nationwide or worldwide, especially now that theaters are available for sale? Um, well, yeah. I would like a Lamley in, in Brooklyn. That would make my life easier. <laughs> <laughs> Work harder, Greg. Look, it's not exactly... <laughs> <laughs> not exactly the, the the time right now. I mean, yes, I, I no. I'm starting to. I mean, look, as we've gone around the country um, uh, with the film, and we're seeing movie theaters and trying to understand what we can do to help, um, what opportunities there are. Um, you know, we, we move slowly. Uh, is is all I'll say. But uh, I still believe that people want to go to movie go, movies. I think there is a future in in operating movie theaters as a business. Um, art house theaters. Yeah, art house theaters. And, uh, and, and, you know, we just have to see what that is. You know, the model changes. I mean, the model was, a, you know, it was a single screen with 400 seats. And now it's, you know, and then it was a multiplex with three auditoriums. And it was a multiplex with eight auditoriums. Are we going to go back to, you know, it being a, a single screen with 200 seats that also shows, uh, you know, comedy and, and live theater and live music? I, you know, I, I think we're, we're, it's evolving. I mean, things are things are always evolving. Right, you uh, guys would love Brooklyn, Tish and uh, Greg. What's that? Here, move out here. You guys would love Brooklyn. Move out here. Oh, I'm just I'm getting him used to the idea that we live in Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, so all three of you are definitely movie stars now. Uh, so when people email you, like they uh, you know. But talking like they know you, that's why. That's what that's the trick the movies do. They make people seem like, you know, like they're known entities. But uh, what is the downside of distribution uh, uh, of distributing this documentary specifically? How has it been easy or difficult to get press? What were some weird problems you the three of you have run into? Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna take that one. I'll, I'll do the best I can here. Uh, basically, you know, look, we're we're, um, we're an independent documentary, right? Um, it's uh, it's uh, it, you know, p people um, have there's a huge appetite for documentaries, but it, it it appears that people have also sort of enjoyed watching documentaries on Netflix, um, and and that's kind of where there's been a huge growth market. Going out to see documentaries, it's it's less common. I also didn't have a Nat Geo or Netflix uh, marketing budget. Um, I had a, you know, a, a singular uh, uh, push and, you know, using, you know, spit and rubber bands and, you know, tape and, and you know, kind of doing everything we can as we do as independent filmmakers. Same with the marketing. I, you know, I, I also, uh, it's been a steep learning curve for me in terms of like, how do I, how do I market a film? I, 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 this is my first time doing this. So I've made mistakes. I've, I've stepped in you know, stepped in uh, potholes and, and basically tried to sort of find my way out. And, and I, in the course of that, um, what we've, what, what, what I've learned is that the, the movie um, people, audiences who see it are genuinely moved by their story. That is the lovely story and what, what's here. The love story that everyone talks about, um, which is, you know, shines through, uh, which was, you know, just happened uh, organically uh, because that's, that's what's there. And, and, and then this sort of, uh, you know, journey that Greg takes and that it then backs into kind of the zeitgeist, this larger questioning that we're having is what's the future of film? What's the future of, you know, independent film, cinema, documentaries, and, and all of this, this is sort of, we, we back into a zeitgeist. In terms of, uh, in terms of reviews, we've done very well on both coasts and 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 in and, and in between, um, we've gotten wonderful reviews um, and and uh, great audience responses. I say that that's great. The the actual economics of this at the moment is that we you know the audiences you know we, we're doing more event based. Uh, screenings, um, which feels to be kind of a bit more of the evolution of um, harder to fill a whole week, right? Create, a, you know, two nights or one night in a city and then bring everyone out for that. So you have then a bigger house for that event. 
you know, do Q and A's around that event so that then that also creates a, oh, I must see, or I got to be there. Um, that helps with it as opposed to, oh, I'll get to it. Or, you know, people, uh, I mean, we, I've I had people on, you know, on Facebook say, I can't, I'll, I'll, I'm not coming out. I'm going to watch it on streaming. And I just, you know, uh, okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, I, you know, you can't, you can't, you can't fight that point of view. Um, but, but the whole point is to actually, thus the name and thus the theme and 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 the experience is to see it in the theater you know what would if i were to do this again i you know as a as a if i would do if i don't first of all i probably would never do this again because <laughs> it's just too hard but um what i would what i would probably do is i would think marketing first that's probably what I would say. Think marketing first so that, I mean, I, you know, I have an amazing girlfriend who is an astounding, she's a producer on the film. She did the incredible job with the posters. She is a graphic artist. She's made, you know, marketing materials for me. She's absolutely astounding. And she's sort of taped, duct taped me together when I've fallen apart, when I've been under enormous stress. Um, I, I, you know, there's not, not enough uh, uh, thank yous in the world for what she's done and how she's contributed to this. But not everyone has a girlfriend who's a graphic graphic artist and and you know and how do you how do you do this how do you actually find friends and relationships that kind of then put together what you need as greg was saying like it's one thing to make a movie but you got to you got to think entirely different to then take it out and actually figure out how you're going to monetize that or the, the the actual process of of getting it out there is is not for the weak of heart for sure yeah distribution is very difficult i tell indie filmmakers to think of uh distribution as the fourth and the final part of filmmaking. But uh, this documentary might save the Lamley theaters and might save art house filmmaking uh, exhibition as a whole. So even if you become broke and homeless, Raphael, you've done a great service to the, to the art form. <laughs> That's right. Hey, Raphael, I, 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 I want to add on that and just say, you know, what you were talking about, that is the hard part is getting it in front of audiences. I, I totally agree with that. And I see it time and time again. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the sort of critic that one person referred to as a truffle hunter, right? Like I'm out in the woods sniffing around trying to find the truffles and, and, you know, they're not the ones that have the six, seven, eight figure marketing budgets or whatever. Um, and this is, this is a truffle, this movie. And I do believe that eventually people will, recognize it as a classic it's just going to have legs it's really going to and it's also a really interesting document of a particular time in history for for the medium and there have been a couple of good ones about drive-ins as well but that you know this one is really really special and i think what well, part of what makes it so special is the personal story that you've captured so well of the, you know the entire lemley family and i got to tell you you know it's very rare that i see so many people being so kind and decent to each other under the same roof in one movie yeah. so it's almost like it's a kind of a weird kind of a emotional pornography for me because that was not my experience growing up you know i grew up in a family of artists but it wasn't like this where everybody seemed to be looking out for each other and rooting for each other not just in the same household at that moment but multi-generationally to see people from fa you know fathers and sons and grandsons all sitting around together talking about oh how are we going to keep the business going is very inspirational i think uh, Matt, uh, since you might have a German background, maybe Filipino, who knows? Uh, did you uh, did you did you enjoy the uh, German immigrant story that you saw in the documentary, or any, something? My question is something related to that. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's and it's the immigrant, you know, it's the immigrant experience kind of in a nutshell. And it's, it, you know, so many, so many families who are in the entertainment business went through that. And, and the story of, you know, moving from uh, uh, of the filmmaking beginning, essentially on the East Coast, particularly in New Jersey, and then migrating westward, like part of the story, this documentary talks about it. And a lot of documentaries leave this out. They get to the part where filmmaking moves from the East Coast to the West Coast, and they say it's because of the weather and the fact that you could fake so many different kinds of locations, which is true. But the other part is they were escaping Edison's goons who were going to destroy their theater for not paying a licensing fee for using the projector. You know, right. that, that part always gets left out. And, and I'm, people are always stunned when I tell them about it. That Somehow that's not in the history books usually. Oh, that's cool that you know that. That's great. That's really great. <laughs>
Yeah, I, I didn't know any of that as well. And I, I found that, I mean, Greg uh, Greg was the first one to introduce me to this. And, and, I, and I've spent a lot of time now reading about it and talking to the people. But it, it is a fascinating caveat of how history plays it directly into this family as well. And how the stories, the family story happened directly as a result. The other thing that, by the way, uh, Matt is as a historian and, and is the fact that this, you know, um, Carl Lemley, this sort of pugnacious kind of four foot German Jew, basically, you know, went to went to war. You know, this David Goliath story against this Edison Trust, and went, you know, really went to the Supreme Court because he said, "I can make movies. This art form started in Europe. You didn't make it. You can't own this, Mr. Edison." And I'm I'm going to make sure that that you know we and because of that we have independent cinema because of because of that that Supreme Court decision it's it's astounding uh, when you think about it just the 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 ripple uh, the sort of the knock on effects of that just single single handedly what he did. Well, it's interesting too that like you know ca capitalism doesn't necessarily need to be incompatible with the greater good. You know, and like that's the number one reason to go to go to court over something like that is because they're restricting your business and making it impossible for you to earn a decent living and support your family and grow, grow the industry. But this other thing is, it's just wrong to do that. Mm -hmm. It's just wrong to do that. And there's examples of that in tech right now, like the fact that, you know, if I want to get my Apple laptop or phone repaired, I have to go to an Apple store. You know, I mean, like that's that's not right. <laughs> I mean, it's a wonderful it's a wonderful story, and it's and it's beautifully told, and and you know, it's it's strange to think of a film with so much hardship in it as a feel good movie, but this one definitely is. <laughs> oh, that's a good, that's great! I love that. Thank you for that. That that's you that's. Yeah. We'll make money on this movie. No worries. We'll. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I I hope I didn't overplay that in terms of what I was saying. I just you know it, it's just it's the it's the journey that every independent filmmaker obviously faces, which is where you where you you know the only thing that keeps you going is your belief in what you know what's there. Kush, have you had a chance to program any uh, movies over the years? Push for certain things to be shown? Yeah. <laughs> I always wanted him to play my wife's top five favorite film. <laughs> uh, no, I basically had no say whatsoever in the films. But I want to add that I didn't know that this, that Raphael sold the film to airplanes. And all of a sudden, I just thought, wouldn't that be fun? We're on a plane one day and we Stroll go to the, use the, the restroom and we see people watching us or we, we just walk down the aisle and they're like, <laughs> that, that would be really fun to see a, to see the film on the film plane. Uh, we'll, do, we'll do a Q and A on the plane. Right. <laughs> there you go. Right. But I'm, I thank you, thank you for doing this, help, helping spread the word. Obviously, we all, you know, as filmmakers, we have to, you know, hold, uh, work together. And 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 that, you know, you're an integral part of of you know, again getting the word out and and um and again just you know breaking through the noise you know and and i and you know we're, we're i'm grateful so thank you for this and thank you for your passion and thank you for what you do and i want to thank uh, greg for being an accessible art house theater owner not and and rafael knows and matt knows not easy for no budget micro budget in the art house filmmakers to get the attention of uh art house theater owners to get our movies into theater. So I like the way Greg does things. So hopefully we can keep that chain running, growing out to Brooklyn, worldwide, Sri Lanka. <laughs> yeah. Now Los Angeles, soon the world, lovely theaters, yes. <laughs> yes good work. Uh, Raphael, you wanna tell people all about the upcoming two shows in LA? Where yeah. people should go yeah. to the movie on the theaters. Tish, why don't you tell us about the two shows in LA? Okay, so Thursday night at March 30th. Uh, Thursday, March 30th at the Royal, which is in West LA at 7 30. Conversation yeah. with oh, conversation with Nicole Holof Center, who Ooh. we absolutely adore. <laughs> and I'm I'm truly looking forward to, to doing yes, this. Movie coming out, right? What? Yes. yes. Movie coming yeah, out. Movie coming Haven't out. seen it. Saw the trailer and immediately thought that's the number one movie on my list right now. 
That's the power of when you are in a movie theater, you get to see the trailers. You don't always get to see trailers when you're watching TV. Um, then the second one, I'm not going to do in Raphael. It's at 12 noon in Santa Ana at Frida. the Frida Theater. Awesome. Um, then that same day on April 2nd, Sunday, April 2nd at 2 p.m. at our town, town center Lemley Theater that I'm bringing my stepmother to. She's been watching the film being made for the last few years and wow. it never, never played it in. Oh, this will be her first movie. Her first, first time movie. back in the movie theater. Oh, wow. That's great. That's wonderful. Tish knows so many people and and I, I like every house in the bay area when literally the half the audience were fot <laughs> friends the only people in the theater were my friends <laughs> there were a couple extras but... Trish, I'm going to promote my movie when it plays at Lemley. <laughs> yeah. i'm all yeah. over it we're also going to be screening on uh, april 8th in chicago at the music box that's right 4 30 p.m so that's uh going to be exciting um have you shown in new york yes we did we, we did IFC and then and then also at new plaza and and um it was a wonderful run um you know that's how that's how we're here um uh that's how i saw the movie i emailed you matt but you know you're a busy man sometimes that's true and then yeah. rafael is going to be a screening in boston uh we're playing for a week at the west newton cinema starting april 14th and there'll be a q a screening on sunday april 16th and then in Worcester, and then uh, perhaps in Maine. And uh, anyway, there, we we will we're somewhere between seventy and eighty cities, I guess, <clears throat> by the time we're done, and and that's great. Um, and we, um, uh, you know, basically the the if you go to onlyintheaters.com, you'll find out all the other dates that are playing and and where we're playing and and when. Recently, I saw sixty five, and that's one of the five five or so movies I've seen in theaters. Uh, and uh, only in theaters is much better. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Right. Matt, any last words? Oh, I just, one thing, I couldn't find the spot for it, but I just wanted to, to share with Greg, which is uh, one of my fondest movie-going experiences in L.A. was the Lemley, Sun, the Sunset Five showed a movie called North Fork by the Polish brothers, came out yes. in 2004. Yep. And I and I uh, saw it in L.A. I just, you know, was out there for other reasons. And I always try to see movies, you know, when I'm anywhere. And I fell in love with it. And I went around telling everybody that they had to go see this movie. And I almost physically dragged some people to see it there. And I went to see it one last time. It was like the end of its run. And I went to the last show on a Thursday. I was there were like five people there. And I was so moved by that film. And I came out and I sat on the steps and I was just thinking about how profound i thought that movie was and an employee of the theater came out and he was cleaning up and he you know he saw me sitting there and he said he said are you okay and i said yeah i, I just saw this movie it really knocked me out it just was very a very deep profound experience and he says was it north fork uh -huh. <laughs> and i said yes it was and he said yeah i think i'm on the verge of being fired because no one knows where i am i keep going back into the theater to, to watch <laughs> north fork again so whoever that guy was, I hope he I hope he didn't get fired. And he probably still works for us. Right. Maybe, maybe he's a manager now. Who knows? Well, we have a lot of lonely employees from Sunset Five that came and work. They still work at other theaters. We were so sad to to have to leave that location. That's such a sweet story. Sweet yeah. story. North Fork, you're gonna make me now. I want to see it. <laughs> yeah, it was great. It was so funny that he called it. He's like, "Was it North Fork?" And I'm like, "Yeah." Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, well and that's why we, you know, it, it, it's why I love what I do, but it's also really why my employees, many of whom have worked for us for 30 you know, years, 30 years and, and, you know, and they're 50 years old, so I don't know, you know, <laughs> you know it's mad. Um, but, you know, I mean, A, we love movies um, and, uh, but we love, we love being able to share movies with people yeah. and to be there when someone sees something that, you know, has a profound impact on your life. And, you know, you, you're not the filmmaker, you didn't make that movie, but you're part of connecting people with something that is life-changing. Um, and it can be the movie, it can be the person they see the movie with, it can be, you know, the experience of, of seeing it, but they are a different person walking out of that movie theater than they were walking in. And, 
you know, to, to be present um, at that moment is, is, you know, special. Thank you.